So there's a lot to be said for a priori power analysis in SEM. So Wang and Ramtula created Power SEM, located here. Link in the description, which allows you to conduct a power analysis for SEM a priori, instead of as a post hoc analysis. And this is really important because post hoc analyses for power are a little redundant. By that time, you've already collected your data, and so it's a little bit too late unless you have easy access to collect more data. With that in mind, let me show you this tool. So, the default model they propose is just one with an x and a y variable and x predicts y. If you're not familiar with this syntax, it's based on Levon. If I were to set this model, we can visualize it, and this is what it looks like, x predicts y, each have three indicators, and if I'm cool with that, I hit proceed. And here's the part that requires a little bit of thinking. You need to set the values, or the expected estimated values, of each parameter. You may think this is a little bit tedious or arduous, and it is, but we can make it easy. Let's just think in rough estimates. So these ones here, these are all the latent factor to indicator measures. And so we would hope these turn out to be about 0.7 or above. So let's put 0.7 in here. And we can just drag this down for all those indicator measures. And then the regression, well, that depends on a lot of things, but a modest regression on a standardized scale, which is what it's expecting, is about a 0.35. Now you can play with that if you think it'll be a weaker or a stronger relationship. The residual variances I'm going to skip, and then it has the total variance fixed at 1. Once I've inserted all of these, the regression coefficients and the factor loadings, I can hit set residual variances for me, it will estimate them for me, and then I can check this box here and drag it down, or double click that handle and it jumps straight down and confirm these parameter values. It's now going to run Monte Carlo simulations, anywhere from 100 to 10,000 of them. And you get to set what your sample size is. In this case, we start with 200 as a reasonable sample size. Go ahead and click Estimate. It runs down here pretty fast if you're just doing 100. And if you look in the right column over here, the far right, you can see that for this model, we can easily estimate the measurement model, these indicator loadings. We have perfect power with 200 sample size and p-value of 0.05 and the estimates we entered. To estimate the structural model, we have also above 80, which is good, that's what we're looking for here, above 80 power, and we have a 94, which is good, and, and for all of these others, we also have power. Don't worry about the covariances down at the bottom. Now let's play with this a bit. What if we only had 100. Let's estimate this again. Again, the measurement model is going to be fine. But look, this structural path, we don't have sufficient power. So we want to come up here and see what is, what is the minimum we can get away with, which is probably not a great strategy. But if you have a very difficult to obtain sample size, then this might be a strategy you need to employ. So let's say 110. Run it again. And there it is, we got over 80. And so if our estimates end up being similar to what we estimated back here in the set parameter values, then we'd probably be okay with 110 in our sample size. If we wanted to be fairly confident, we could bump this up to a thousand simulations and try running it again. Mind you, this will take a little bit of time. I will fast forward. And there we go, and it looks like the more accurate simulation puts us at around, right at around, 80 power. So for this particular model, assuming the estimates we entered are fairly accurate, 110 is probably the lowest sample size we would want to obtain. To play it safe, we should probably include a little bit more. Now if you have more questions, you can click on help, and it will walk you through how to estimate the parameter values accurately. Also in the resources, there's some more estimation calculators and some citations. To end this, let's go back to specify model and try a different model, just so you can see how this syntax works a little bit. So once again, X and Y are factors, 
and these lowercase x and y are indicators. So if I were to add another x indicator here, it'd be plus x4, and let me do another y indicator here, plus y4, then if I go view that model, you see we now have four indicators on each. Let me go back. Let's add another one, maybe a mediator, m equals, and that's a tilde up in the top left of your keyboard probably, and let's set this to be m1 plus m2 plus m3, and let's say that y is requested upon by x and m, meaning they both have arrows pointing at y, and let's say that m is regressed upon by x. And let's go visualize that. And here you see we now have x predicting m, m predicting y, x predicting y, so we have a mediated model. And if we wanted to throw some actual mediation testing in there to see if we have enough power to estimate an indirect effect, we could go back to specify model and define an indirect effect. So let's say that AB, our indirect effect, is equal to a times b. And let's go ahead and put a times b here. And just for the sake of completion, let's put c here. Let's see what this looks like. You can see over here, or possibly you can see, let me zoom in, we have a, b, and c. And it looks like we didn't actually want to multiply a times b. We want to multiply c times b, so let's go fix that. There we go. I've just switched c and a, set that model, and it switches. We now have a times b. a times b is our indirect effect from x to y through m. We'll set those parameters just like we did before. I'm assuming that we'll have about a 0.7 on our factor loadings about a 0.35 on our direct paths and then residuals I'll leave open and the labeled parameter a times b our indirect effect I'm assuming that is going to be about 0.35 times 0.35 which is about 0.1 and I will set residual variances automatically those got set and I will estimate all of these for power. There we go. I'm actually not going to bother estimating these two for power and this one. There we go. The total and residual variances for the factors and the relationships. And I will confirm. And it says all parameter values need to be specified. So I forgot to specify this one down here. Looks like it deleted it for some reason. I'll put that back at 0.1. Yep, it's still there. Confirm parameter values. There we go. I'm going to take this down to 200, and let's see what we can do with 110. It is going to be underpowered at 110, but this will be a good example. Estimate. And here we go. We have enough power to estimate the measurement model, it appears. And if we go down here, x on y, we have probably enough power. m to y, probably almost enough power. And x to m, about enough power. Now, if I wanted to be sure, I'd probably need to run a higher number of simulations. Before I do that, I'm going to get rid of everything I don't really need to be estimating. You see all this stuff in here? I don't really need to be estimating these variances. But I do need to estimate for the indirect effect down at the bottom. Notice I'm way underpowered for an indirect effect. So let's go back. And first thing, I'm going to uncheck residual variances and then confirm parameter values. And instead of 110, let's do 250 and see if that's enough for this indirect effect. I'm also gonna bump this up to 500 simulations, get a more accurate estimation. And there we go. Looks like we can, again, assess our measurement model just fine. We'll have enough power for that. And then if we go look at the structural model down here, we have plenty of power with 250, even for that indirect effect. I'm going to do one more time down to 200, see if that is good enough. And let's see what we have down here. 
Yes, sure enough, 200 sample size is enough for this kind of model. Probably more than enough. If I wanted to play it safe, I would gather 200. If my population was hard to access, I might fiddle with this a little bit more, see if 150 is enough. Drop this down so it goes a little faster. And it looks like it is not. So I'm not going to fiddle with this more, but I just wanted to show you how it works. I cannot stress enough that this is highly dependent upon the parameter values you set here. If you don't anticipate strong factor loadings, which you could infer from published Cronbox alphas, or the loadings you observe in other publications, if they're using the same measures, or if you don't anticipate strong structural path estimates, then these values all would change, just, just as a quick demonstration. Let me change these all down to 0 0.2. And that would make my indirect path, a times b, 0 0.2 times 0 0.2, which is 0 0.04. Confirm those. Run this one last time. Just keep in mind these numbers down here. In fact, what I'll do is I'll estimate this and then scroll down. And there we go. You can see that this changed drastically. Those structural paths are way underpowered now. So this is highly dependent upon the estimates you put in for those parameter values. So do not assume that just because this simulation comes out with power estimates above 0.8 that you're good to go. If you're worried, then be conservative. I hope that helps.